morning, everyone. Good morning, Jeff. Yeah, it's a pleasure to kind of get up here and continue our Esther series. Um, I apologize for not queuing up anyone to read. We, we, we do have a little bit to read this morning. I'll go ahead and do it, but if people just kind of want to follow through with me on it, that'd be fantastic. Um, but first, I'll do a little bit of a recap of where we left previously, in case anyone hadn't tuned in on that. Um, so, kind of a little bit of background for us. So this, this, whole, this whole chronicle, as we like to say now, taking place in what would uh, currently be, or well, kind of the uh, kingdom of Persia back in the day. Um, but it's, the, it's centered around, so we have the king of Persia, but then we have the Jews who were, who were essentially taken away, taken away into a pagan kingdom, and they essentially is assimilated into life there, and perhaps not so much forgotten God, but gotten close to it at the very least. Their, their lives would have very much been like the, the, the Persians that they would have been surrounded by. And in the first chapter of Esther, it's mostly revolving around the party that the king had, um, you know, very much centered around uh, the planning of battle, but, you know, very much so the, <laughs> the high amount of partying, and in the end, through disobedience from the queen, the queen actually got banished, and that's where it kind of leaves us at the beginning of the second chapter. So what I'll do is just kind of start to start to read through it. Bear with me on some of the names. It's not quite as bad as the first chapter, um, but I'll get going on that now. So we'll start with verse 1. So it says, After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what, he, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan, the citadel, into the women's quarters, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of all the women. Of, of the women. And let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. In Shushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, the uh, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it was, when the king's command and decree were heard, and there were many young women were gathered at Shushan, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, that Esther was also taken to the king's palace, into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor. So he readily gave beauty preparations to her, besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Each young woman's turn uh, came to go in front of King Ahasuerus after she had completed twelve months' preparation, according to the regulations for the women, for thus were the days of their preparation apportioned, six months of oil of myrrh, and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, 
and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women, to the custody of, she uh, of Sheshgaz, the king's, eunuchs, the, the king's eunuch, who kept the concubines. She would not go to the, into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. Now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, uh, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more so than all the other virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants. And he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. When the virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai, as when she was brought up by him. In those days, when Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Teresh, the doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on the on a gallows. And it was written in the book of Chronicles in the presence of the king. Okay. Marvelous. Okay, so... So, so leaving off from, from this, this banishment that we had from the king of Vashti, the previous queen... You know, one of the things that it says first is it just says after these things. It just says after. We don't know how long it transpired bet between these things, between King Ahasuerus finally kind of calming down from that whole situation. Um, it just says you know, some amount of time. However, the first thing that we notice as well <clears throat> is that his helpers, his 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 aides, his advisors instantly jump in here with an idea to try and make him happy again. And as we kind of saw in the, in the last chapter as well, the king is incredibly attentive to his aides, let's say. Um, you know, as, as we heard as well, you know, that, that's something that's mimicked in, in a lot of modern governments. You know, the prime minister will have... As Bethany, I'm sure, could tell us, any number of aides, advisors, everything to try and say, okay, this is what you should do. Um, but we see in this situation that, you know, very much so the king is, whether or not you could say that the king is led along by the helpers, he's certainly very much influenced by the aides. So, the aides all of a sudden realized that for all intents and purposes, they may have gotten the queen banished, so it might have been up to them to help the king get a new one. And what would a king like more than all of the eligible young bachelorettes in the entire kingdom, which was well over a hundred provinces, you know, a lot of potential women to be all of a sudden gathered and said, here, pick one. <laughs> Imagine, imagine. I can't imagine personally, and I'm sure Bethany doesn't want me to imagine either. It's very important, so I, I won't even try to imagine. So, so, this is where our heroine of this chronicle kind, kind of enters the story now. So we, we, we hear a little bit about Esther, we hear a little bit about 
Um, Mordecai, so her uncle, very prominent character, as we'll come to find in, in, uh, in this book. So, what's the, so if we look at verse 10, you know, if we, if we kind of, you know, go over, so we've got a little bit of the genealogy here, a little bit of the history here. This, cha this chapter is all still very much set up for, uh, for the Chronicle of Esther, but probably one of the most notable things here that we see is if we look in verse 10, it says, Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. So, you know, we, we see in the context of this situation that, you know, you have the Jews taken, you know, initially very much as captives into this area, and, you know, almost for certain they would have been viewed as different or others or inferior or whatever what have you so you know Mordecai who had raised Esther all of a sudden goes oh hang on she's also being taken to you know this pagan king to potentially be um his wife hang on what could possibly happen if they find out that she's a Jew, or if, or if they find out some sort of you know, information about her or her family, that, or at the very least, could either put her down a few rungs, or who, who knows what else may have happened. So, you know, it, it's clear, so she was told to, essentially, don't say anything about it, go along with it, you know, don't, don't try and, I'm sure, make any waves, at the very least, in the beginning. Um, and another thing that kind of tells us a little bit about the time scale of all this, that can you imagine 12 months of, now I know the stereotypical thing is that men always complain that women take a long time to get ready <laughs> when going out, but I'm sure even, if, even an hour or two has nothing on 12 months, 12 months per woman, and it says per woman as well, 12 months, which is pretty intense. Um, I mean, we were engaged for six months, and that was a long enough wait for me. I can't imagine, you know, waiting another six months on top of that. That was enough. That was enough. Um, but so it, so it gives a little bit of information about Esther's side of things. So she was, she was the one very much on the inside, but Mordecai was the one on the outside. And in verse 11, we see that Mordecai was pacing around in front. So so what's what's one of the things that you knew, you normally do when you when you're nervous about someone? You know, you're you're nervous about, you know, oh, it's, you know, you have a family member going in for an interview or doctor's appointment or whatever what have you. Surgery. Surgery. There you go. Very 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 uh, in context example for us. Yeah. I'm sure very much dad might be pacing uh, back and forth when mom's in for the surgery. But this is what Mordecai was doing as well. He knew that Esther, if certain things, her heritage possibly came to light, things could go bad for her. But even on top of that, it's very clear that he cared for her very much. Even though she may not have biologically been his daughter, it's pretty clear that he certainly viewed her as such. So it's natural he would have been worried about her. So... You know, it kind of goes on again, and you know, we, we see more about how she gained great favor, not only in, um, so Haggai, the eunuch who is essentially in charge of all the women, and so, you know, not only does she get pretty preferential treatment almost from the get-go, you know, when she was prevented bef presented before the king, you know, he also thought, you know, wow, you know, 10 out of 10, you know, absolutely fantastic. Um, and, and, and ultimately, as we see, became queen. But, but, so if we, if we start to unpick that a little bit, unpick that a little bit. And I will say, certainly from a personal perspective, a personal note, I hate the unknown in general. I'm sure, as my parents might tell you, as a, as a youngster, I was completely calm and collected all the time. I was never anxious. I, I, I never got nervous before anything whatsoever. 
course, I know there's probably something to be said against lying up here, so I'm not, I'm not going to lie up here. I did get nervous when I was younger. I'm sure a lot of people do as well. A lot of unknown variables. Imagine, imagine if you were in Esther's or Mordecai's position here, you would have had absolutely no idea what you might have been up against going in here. Mordecai pacing back and forth, day in, day out, for 12 months? 12 months, a, a year of essentially your, what would have been like a daughter to him, your daughter squirreled away in the, the, the kingdom of, or the palace of, of a king that doesn't say necessarily whether or not Mordecai may have liked or disliked the guy, but it would have been an incredibly fearful situation for him. So that's a lot of unknown for Mordecai. That's a lot of, that's a, that's a lot of, you, you have no idea what's going to happen, good or bad. And I think, as, as usual, you know, we, we often say that you know, the Bible is not some outdated document. It is not some account of things from 2,000 years ago and, and previously. This is, this is not some old, dusty religious text that we read just to feel good about ourselves. This is a document that guides us through our lives. This is the inspired document that is, has never more been relevant to us than it is today. And it, yeah, it, and, and it teaches us about ourselves today because yeah, I can put my hand up first is who has on a daily basis, there is unknown, there's unknowns and, and variables and anxieties about everyday life that is difficult to that is, that is difficult to deal with. Um, however, however, it, it doesn't end on that though. It doesn't end on that. The the thing that I kind of want to tease out here is that we've spoken a lot about you know in the past you know there's this God's plan, and we don't know exactly, exactly, you know, we, do, we will, as we go through Esther, we, we will unpick more and more about, um, so <laughs> it'll have been already mentioned last week, for instance, that, you know, God is not explicitly mentioned, and uh, there's even some debate as to whether prayer is explicitly mentioned. We don't know whether or not Mordecai may have had firmly in his mind that, oh, he's a believer in God, and he knows God has a plan, and he can, he can rest his faith in God that everything's going to turn out well in the end. We, 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 can't, we can't necessarily say that. And even though we may now, you know, we have the Bible to look back on, we, and we, can have, we have this as a reference but it's still an incredibly difficult thing when we are presented with these unknowns and presented with these troubles and frustrations. It's difficult to kick back, relax, and say that, don't worry, God's got it. So that is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, but, but, we have some other examples in the Bible as well. If we take a look at the story of Joseph, so Joseph and the coat of many colors, um, you know, what, what happened to Joseph? So he got essentially betrayed by his brothers. He got sold into slavery. He got thrown into jail when his master's wife essentially falsely accused him of something. And, you know, he had a pretty tough time year on year for a long time, a long time. And... You know, we see a lot about Joseph, about how he, how he still stayed faithful to God. He, still, he was still incredibly, incredibly loyal and faithful. Um, but that could not have been easy throughout all that time. I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone, and I don't think the Bible says anything about this either. There's no promises made that it will be easy throughout every step of the journey. 
And we see it with Joseph that you know, he ultimately became essentially second in command mm -hmm. in Egypt just under, just under Pharaoh himself. So, so we see a lot of this mirrored in the second chapter of Esther. Esther and Mordecai are faced with an incredible amount of unknowns and difficulties. It's, you know, it is described here that Esther is given preferential treatment, but, you know, truth be told, it doesn't say anything about what Esther's frame of mind or, or what her mindset would have been throughout this entire situation. It'd be, it'd be difficult to imagine that she wasn't nervous throughout some of this. So, 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 so yeah, it's, it's, it's an incredibly difficult situation. Um, however, however, I think we are given enough evidence and we have reason to be confident in the fact that God does have an ultimate plan for us all and God is in ultimate control. I can think back on a number of times um, about how something bad happened. I mean, uh, to, give, to give a personal example, uh, it was the first job I was interviewing for outside of uni. So this was, I was actually in my final year at this time. I went for an interview. It was one of these, I uh, don't know if anyone else has done it before. It was a full day interview. Really? There, there were two actual in-person interviews. There was a written test. There were uh, group exercises, all this. And quite literally, we had people going around all day with notepads and they were making notes on everyone and so on and so forth. The whole interview cohort was 20 people, something like that. Incredibly tough situation. Um, I was interviewing for it with other people from my class as well. So I came out of this thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great to go and work with someone from my class, get a good kickstart on my career, everything like that. I had everything in my mind lined up <laughs> for how I wanted it to be. Everything was lined up. And so it happened, my classmate got the job and I didn't. <laughs> and that was a kicker, let me tell you. I was, I was in a state. I, I you know, it was, oh, the world's coming to an end. And, and I, I, was, I was probably miserable for a couple days after that. That was tough. That was incredibly tough because I had this plan. I had this plan in my mind of how things would go, and it did not turn out like that at all. However, however, again, the point is, the point is, that is not, this is not me comparing myself to Joseph being sold into slavery and thrown into prison. This is not a comparison. However, however, I cannot say with any kind of confidence that I would want to be anywhere else than I am right now. And that step, that loss of the job, failed interview, I might not have, I might not have been here. I might not have been here. So how can we say, how can we say that when difficulties arise and the waters whip up and the waves come crashing down, how can we say that in the end God does not have us in his hands, yeah. in his hands. And it's a difficult thing to think about. It's an incredibly difficult thing to think about. Um, Dad mentioned in, in, the, in the beginning about, about um, God's, God's plan for us and, and time. <laughs> I debated with myself a little bit about this, um, about kind of in what depth to, to go into this. Um, and I'll caveat this with, this is, not, this is not anything to get your head twisted around, but the concept of, you know, we, we, we speak a lot about God's, God's omniscience, his om omnipotence, this, uh, this idea that God is all-powerful, all-knowing. And those are incredibly non-human traits. Those are incredibly non-human concepts to think about, um, you know, I, I, I've, I, I like to read books, and one of the, uh, one of the things that I came across was this, uh, someone, someone was written in 
about all. How on earth does God have enough time if, if 350 million people are praying to God at 10.30 in the evening? How on earth does God have enough time to listen to 350 million people pray at the same time, be able to process what they're saying, you know, you know God, please, I wish I had more hair, and filter out the, okay, I'm going to do this, or okay, no, I'm not going to do this. Now, how on earth does that make sense to us as, as, as people, as humans? And it's an incredibly difficult one to think about. Just like, just like our story of Esther, when Esther might have gotten that first decree that'll have been shout, that could have been shouted out from the town square, perhaps, that, that she was living in, that, hey, every eligible young bachelorette is going to be brought before the king, and you might be chosen to be his new wife. You, you know, how on, how on earth can, can, can it be that we as people think Ooh, okay, you know, I have confidence that God has thought not just one step ahead, not ten steps ahead, but infinite steps ahead. It's almost incomprehensible, incomprehensible to us as people. Um, one of the, one of the uh, examples that I like of thinking about God's view of time um, you know, Dad, Dad mentioned at the beginning that to God there is no past, there is no future. One of the examples that I liked uh, about this, but first before I say that, I'll say an example I didn't like. Example I didn't like. I was originally going to say something with a chess analogy. Um, I do like chess, I don't play much of it, but I thought to myself, ooh, what a great idea. You know, you hear, you hear a lot about these you know, these AI uh, computers that can play chess and calculate billions of moves in a second and so on and so forth. So I thought, oh, it would be great to put out some sort of chess analogy. But then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, it's not chess. It's not chess. Chess is a game where two players use wit and strategy in a test against each other to see who wins. This is not like that at all. There is only one person in control at the end of the day. There's only one person with that ultimate plan that he, that he has set in motion. That then there's only one person with the perfect wisdom, knowledge, and justice to actually see that plan through as it should be. And the only way that is actually right for it to go. Amen. The... The, the, the view of God in time that I like, again, it's, it's a little bit of a, it's, it's not a perfect example. It's not a perfect example. But if you think of time as being a straight line drawn, and it doesn't matter how long this line is, or how many thousands of years we're on now, it could be a fairly long line, but that doesn't matter. If line is a straight line being drawn, then God is the paper that that line is being drawn upon. He is absolutely all-encompassing within it, and I'm not going to try to explain away everything about that. Um, this particular Christian author that I was, that I was reading uh, on this topic, it was interesting, he said, this concept of time and God's perspective on time was originally tackled by the theologians, it was next tackled by the philosophers, and it is now tackled by the scientists. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm not going to go into that, but the, the interesting thing is that everyone is trying to take a stab at it. Everyone is trying to understand it. And it's a difficult one. It is a difficult one. However, this is where our faith in God comes into play. This is... You know, again, as was mentioned before, there are some things that we might not ultimately know and ultimately control. However, the great thing is that we can have ultimate faith and confidence in God. And ultimate faith and confidence in God 
is far greater than looking for ultimate control and ultimate knowledge in everything that might happen. So, so what, what does all this what does all this kind of mean for us in a nutshell as, as we kind of look to close up here a little bit? You know, so we've mentioned God and God's plan. We mentioned the, the importance of it, the importance of, of being willing to, in the face of, of trials and tribulations and struggles, uh, the importance of still being able to look up God and trusting God in his plan. But there's that slight other element as well. There's the willingness to actually be moved by God's plan as well. And part of this involves prayer. Do we, do we listen to God? Do we talk to God? Are we, are we in communication with God? Do we put ourselves in a, in, in a position where we are open to being used as part of God's plan? Do we put ourselves in that place of, you know, saying, God, you know, please, please use me for your plan. Put, put me to that great use. Are our hearts open? You know, we take a look at ourselves as a church. You know, how many opportunities could be around the corner for RCBC if we open ourselves to it and we pray about it and, and, and it is our goal. <laughs> I spoke before about how I had a plan in my mind and I had a goal in mind. The key difference is that was my goal based on my human knowledge and my human assumptions that realistically, let's face facts, whenever we make plans like that, whenever we make goals like that, now, there's no guarantee to say that that will never match up with what God may have in mind, that that will never match up with what God has in store for us. However, however, if we go into it with Chad's goal or Chad's plan, and that is our initial, that is, that is our frame of mind right there, I think we're setting ourselves up to fail. I think what we should be going into it with is what is God's plan? What is God's goal for us? How can we be used for God's purpose in all of this?